said, it's really important for me, Joe, that not that people think about this stuff, but that they think through it. You know, and if you think through it, then you're going to have a, a variety of different um, opportunities to reflect, to put it in historical and social cultural context, to dialogue it with other people, to um, listen to the standard narratives and then push back and then think about some counter narratives. To uh, you, it, it, it's a much broader, broader thing than just thinking about it. Oh, I'm thinking about this is how this is what's going on. This is how people feel. Okay, yeah, now because you know, no, you gotta. It, it has to be a process. It has to be a process where people are very thoughtful. It has to be a process where people are very, um, very committed to to doing this this self work over time. I was talking to some children the other day, and we were talking about um, Black Lives Matter, and and you know knowing that the organization is different than the movement, which is different than the, the brand and the hashtag, which is different than the trend, which is, you know, one of the kids really, really spoke to the fact that it's a moment. And, and the fact that it is a moment, and we talk about it all the time, is are they going to take advantage of the moment? Because unfortunately, that's how humanity works. Things happen in seasons, and either you, either you take advantage of the season and do good work during that season, or you miss that opportunity. I think that um, so so a lot of folks are 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 are, are co-opting. That was the word that we put. Has has the Black Lives Matter conversation been co-opted? A lot of folks have um, co-opted this this moment in time, and they've co-opted it in ways in terms of they made it um, they made it work for their business, they made it work for their um, for their celebrity, they made it work for um, for a myriad of other things. But I think that one of the challenges that we're going to have to deal with is how do we make this moment count so that we don't see a moment like this again? And that's what I'm hoping. And I think that part of that is gonna be rooted, Joe, in relationships that people establish with other people so that they continue to hold each other accountable and also can continue to dialogue these things. Um, if we're gonna talk about the variety of, of um, the variety of, of, of things that we're talking about right now, a big issue for me is, are we having conversations that are sustainable? Are we doing these things in a, in a manner that will cause us to grow as human beings? Or as you said earlier, are we just throwing people on a guilt trip, making them afraid, making them mad? I mean, I have to be quite honest. I, if I thought about these things, I, I you know, I'm a Bible believer and, 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 and I'm a black man and I'm a dad and I'm a husband and I'm all these different things, right? If I thought about these things as, as a dad, I would be afraid. If I thought about these things as a, as a black man, I'd be mad all the time. For me, I have to think, think about these things through the lens of my spiritual self so that I can begin to say, okay, cool. This is humanity and we are, you know, we are all have to share this planet and we are all connected. So how do I work with you on us not how do i work with you on you how do you how do you work with um, me on me i think how do we work together on us and looking at what is the role that we all play there's a great book that i love it's called um under our skin by benjamin watson and it really was written on the heels of a facebook post that was um that went viral after the mike brown after the mike brown murder and one of the things that um that he challenges everybody in this book is you have to think about these things from both sides, irrespective of the side that you find yourself on. You really have to say, okay, what might this other person be thinking about? What might this other person be, be, be experiencing? And that's not sympathy, that's not empathy, that's humanity. That's something totally different. I think oftentimes we think, okay, either it's sympathy or empathy. No, this is the third space. And I think that that's, that's where, that's kind of where I am with this, Joe. So this whole conversation, I think that it is also rooted in relation, in relationships. Um, you and I talked about this a lot. We talk about how, um, how you know, and, and I've shared with you, you know, some of my work speaks to different types of re relationships. You have transactional, you have interactional, and I think that a lot of our relationship, even even around these conversations, as it relates to to anti-blackness, and as it relates to race, class, and culture in our society, and as it relates to cultural competency, a lot of these conversations. They are transactional. People are trying to move us from one place to another. That doesn't work, in my opinion.
I think that these relationships and these 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 in, these, inter, these these things that we're doing have to be interactions. They have to take experiences and and they have to take um they have to take encounters and make them experiences. They have to take um um just just personal agendas and make them into shared beliefs and and and, and common agendas. Um, there's there's a lot that's going on. So yeah, so that's kind of where I am with in terms of the the the, the period that we're that we're in that we're in and then how do we kind of address it i think it's a, as my nephew told me a while a while ago he said uncle d it's a long game and i and i truly believe it's a long game you know and and this is something that we have to build up because i was oh gosh joe side note side note and i know i'm rambling a lot man but i gotta get this to you um there's an author named isabel wilkerson and she actually um wrote the book warmth of other sons which i read a few years ago and just kind of fell in love with but the second part of that is um, she has a book out right now, and that book is called um, that book is called uh, uh, Cast. And in Cast, she speaks about you know the fact that what we're calling um, a, a racist society or racist system, it's really a caste system, and we see a lot of things in America that are very similar to the caste system that we understand to be part of the history of India. And and also she she speak to um to what happened in Nazi Germany as being a caste type system, right? So one of the points that she made though, she said um, when you look at if you just look at um, how long that how, from from the time period of us dealing with racism and the time period of us dealing with um, a variety of things in our culture around um, around racism, oppression, things like that. And then we, she was talking about how long we have to go as a country before we have that same amount of time. So the system of slavery was, was for a certain number of years leading into, um, leading into 1865. And then between then and now, we still have you know, several years to go before we can say we've, we've been a culture that, that is not, that is not um, that is that, that is not rooted in slavery. So when we think about this, we have a whole history, and we have to think about timelines. We have to think about how, about how people change. Um, I'm 55 years old, and you know, in some of our presentations, we talk about this. I'm 55 years old. I was born in 1965. 1965, we we you know, blacks had just gotten the 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 the, the um the right to vote, you know, uninhibited in this country. Um, 1965. In the last 55 years, um, a buddy of mine, Professor Brad Stone at LMU. He talks about us being in reconstruction now. And so it's so many different things, Joe, that we have to think about. And so as I do workshops, I try to get people to think beyond just the data because the data is important. But I want them through a historical and a social cultural lens to kind of look, look at where we are and then allow all conversations to be not about society, but let them be about me. Not me, Darren, but be about me, the individual. Let them be mirror conversations so that people can begin to say, all right, how do I see myself? And there's so many people I'm just quoting and talking about because they're just all in my brain right now. But John Henry Clark talks about history being a, 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 a compass that shows us where we are in the map of human geography. That's a question. That's why history is so important to me. And, and I'm not, and I don't purport myself to be a historian, but what I do purport myself to be is a lover of history, one who learns from history and one who can grow from history and one who believes that 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 you know, as, as Booker T. Washington said, I just I'm quoting everybody right now. I'm just I'm, I'm having a great time. But as he said, he never learned anything. He never seen anything gained from holding back a fact. And so, if we accurately understand history, then we should accurately have some facts, and we should accurately be able to assess who we are in the moment, and we should accurately be able to assess how we're going to work on ourselves in the context of us being part of this humanity. And then, you know, we begin to have those conversations about anti-blackness, racism, cultural competency, and things like that. that that's kind of where I am on this. What we're calling racism, it's really anti-blackness. If you look historically, all different types of cultural groups, well, let's, let's look historically. Um, and, and, and the foundation of this country, we have pretty much three groups. We have the indigenous people, that were here, 
that were, you know, that were mistreated and ostracized and marginalized by, you know, by um, folks who came from Europe. We have the Europeans, and then we have the the Africans who 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 became the African Americans who were enslaved. Now the indigenous people were mistreated, and I'm not going to have that conversation right now because that's a different type of conversation. But one of the things we do know about the indigenous people is that were, they were unable to be enslaved. They knew the land they could go. Um, indentured servants who came here from Europe, over time, they could just blend into, you know, the, the standard society. I think that the issue is just this, is that, yeah, by our skin, by the melanin, by the fact that we were easily identifiable, um, Americans of African descent have been stamped. Now, what does that mean? Um, it means a lot of stuff. Um, it means everything from folks who are crying out now, I wish you loved our culture as much as, um, I wish you loved us as much as you loved our culture. That's an issue. Um, things that like, like Doc Rivers or the Clippers when he stated that um, we love America, we just wish America loved us back from an African-American standpoint. But this issue about being stamped means that the, 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 the African, the enslaved African in America, he couldn't hide it out. And so what happened is that as folks came into this country, they began to say, and that's kind of how whiteness kind of developed. Whiteness wasn't a thing. You were, you were Polish, you were Italian, you were Russian, you were English, you were, you know, you were Spanish. Whiteness wasn't a thing. But whiteness became a thing when there was a need to separate from that group that was being oppressed, that was stamped, that group that we could easily identify, I need to separate from that group. This is, this is just Darren's perspective. So we, we, we go a little bit further and I'm thinking in terms of how do these people, how do these, these, these people who are being oppressed and, mar and marginalized over centuries, how do we understand it? So then we have to look at it again historically. We have to say a lot of groups have come to the country. First of all, we were involuntary immigrants as opposed to voluntary immigrants, which makes a difference. If you go someplace, choice is a great motivator and lack of choice is a great depressor. So if you go someplace because you want to, that's one thing. But if you go someplace because you were forced, forced to, that's a totally different conversation. So we were involuntary immigrants. As involuntary immigrants, we built this country. And when I say we built this country, literally, by the labor of slaves, I don't think anybody would argue that, you know, this country has, 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 was, was built um, from, from the White House to cities to all this kind of stuff. But this is where it gets interesting for me, Joe, is I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about how so many, um, so many cultural groups have come to this country and they've been able to have an Ellis Island experience. They've been able to have a Statue of Liberty experience. They've been able to make America the land of opportunity and dreams and hopes. But when you see blacks in America, which you've seen typically blacks who are, who are um, descendants of those who were enslaved, typically what you see is a whole group of people that continue to get jumped over or to get, to, to, to get jumped over by every other group that comes to this country. Now, you could say one of two things. You could say that's by accident or that's by design. Anti-blackness would show you historically that many things are by design. Everything from the, the restrictions and covenants, why people couldn't buy homes, um, why, why, um, to, to what happened with, with, um, with, with, uh, the, with, during the Reconstruction era where you know it happened for about 10 years and they took that back to the conversations around 40 acres and a mule to opportunities that um, students have to, even to this, to this day, you know, to, 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 for jobs and, 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 and advancement. And when you look at the average income of, of black families versus, you know, white families, I mean, there's, so, so some of the, um, some of the folks would say, well, you just don't have black folks working hard, but then you got to pause and you got to ask questions. Okay. So what happened with places like Tulsa? And Rosewood and 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 the various different cities around the country. If you do your historical research, where you've seen black communities thriving, and then they were not based upon some type of racist oppression or or something that came their way. So you have to ask these questions. And I'm and and, and see anti-black racism. First of all, 
when people say systemic racism, a lot of folks, even some black folks say, I don't believe in systemic racism. I think they don't believe in because they don't understand it. Because they're not looking at it through a historical lens. They're saying, they're saying, well, I know white people who are not who are not racist. Well, not gonna Joe, I'm talking to you. You're one of my good friends. You're a white guy. You know, you're not racist. But that doesn't mean that systemic racism doesn't occur. What that means is that there are, we have to understand it differently. Systemic racism is not talking about individuals, it's talking about a, a system that over time, if you historically analyze it, has marginalized and kept people from having access primarily due to their race. That's what it comes down to. And so when we begin to think about it in that context, then we go back to anti-blackness, you have to ask, well, doggone it, why do the black folks just continue to get jumped over? Why are black kids having the most problems? Why, why is our, do we have um, black representation in this country of being about 13, 14%, but in our prisons being almost half? What, what's going on? I mean, we know, that, we know that white people get shot by the police, but very rarely or not as often do we hear about bl white people getting shot by the police when they are unarmed or, or, or getting shot by the police when they are um, in a city. Matter of fact, we often see white people who are armed where police officers may de-escalate. I don't think that that's because that policeman um, just says, I want to treat this person a certain way. I think it's a mindset, it's a system of anti-blackness, of, of, of anti-black racism that kind of has a lot of different tentacles that we need to understand. And it, it, it far beyond our conversation right now, but we have to think in terms of that. Why, you know, I, I have, some, um, I, I have some, some friends of mine and we were having some conversations and most of these folks are primarily white. And I was asking them, I said, you know what, the question that we need to ask is when white people see black people, what do they think? Do they think about the need to, to reform, to fix, to benevolently be there for them? Or do they just see themselves as another human with which, from which they can learn and interact? That's a real question. Do they see them as a threat? Or do they just see them in their humanity? And I'm not saying don't see color because we do see color. And when you say you don't see color, that means you're denying a whole lot of other things. That is not what I'm saying. Matter of fact, I think that that is disrespectful. But what I am saying is that as you see people, do you see people? Or do you see some other? Do you know the reason, and, and this is across history, with every, in any kind of situation where there's been a genocide or a marginalization or an oppression of people, there's always been the need to dehumanize them. Even, if, even when we look at like, a, a, a situation in Rwanda, where the people look the same. Situation in, in Kosovo, where the people look the same. Situation in, in Northern Ireland, where the people look the same. The way that you, the way that you go about um, actually disenfranchising folks, the first phase, in Nazi Germany, the first phase is dehumanization. That's kind of at the root of this, of, of, of this um, anti-Black racism. And, and Joe, I, I'm, I am convinced that, um, that this is something, this is a disease, if you will, that has infected a lot of us in a lot of different ways. It's not, and, and, it, and I mean, if I think that, if I think a certain way about a certain cultural group, one of the things that, um, that, that, that um, Isabel Wilkerson talked about in cast, is she just talked, she, instead of talking about race, she used height. And what if we said anybody that was over six feet tall, and we had a whole slew of things that we kept them from and talked about them, and this, this, I mean, it's funny because just on a side note, um, I'm, I'm about six one, and I'm over 250. I'm not finding a lot of stuff on the racks. It's just that simple. When I go to the store, I got to think differently. Um, my shoe size is size 12. Um, I'm not always going to find, actually, my son, son in law shoe size is size 16. He can't get them in the store. When we start thinking about those kinds of things, like, yeah, that's kind of crazy. You know, that this physical attribute that you really, well, maybe my weight I can do something about, but these, this physical attribute that you really don't think about often. Um, this is actually keeping me from having access and opportunity. We don't think about it in terms of everything else except for, well, we don't think about it as much as we should. And it hasn't been as, as nefarious in its usage as this issue of race, as this issue of skin color, as this issue of pigmentation. It's crazy when you really just think the fact that somebody walking down the street says, I don't like this person because they are a different color. I don't want to interact with this person because they are a different color. I don't want to work with this person. I don't want that. 
we have to ask ourselves what is really going on in our psyche as a country in our psyche as, as, as a species that we, we can't we have to ask some really hard questions when we begin to think historically and drill down and really peel back that onion of what's happening with us in society that's the work i try to do i just try to get the get people to just think and and, and really say hey we have to we have to address some of these things at, a, at another level it's not just about the conversations it's not just about getting mad it's really about the it's really about action activity change and 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 and, and making making things go if you will and, and when i say go i don't mean like you know go away that would be great but i'm saying making things go in a sense of how do we operate better how do we think about you know a lot of corporations do a lot of strategic planning okay and strategic planning is so that we can look at our mission and our vision and operationalize these things i think that we do not have a strategic plan that we have effectively put in action to address these issues around race, class, and culture. We're just talking about them. Every time I talk to a school, every time I talk to a principal, they're like, okay, um, or I talk to an organization, they're like, okay, we wanna do this work. All right, fine, so what do you think in terms of outcomes? What would it look like when you get it right? That's the question. Because if we don't know what it looked like when, it, when we get it right, we don't know what we're shooting for. And if we don't know what we're shooting for, we have to take a step back and say, you know what, where are we going? And if we, I mean, and if we haven't had those conversations on where we're going, or if we start thinking about where we're going, then we ask, well, how did you get here? And then that back to historical conversation. I, I, I continue to push back because I think in terms of black lives mattering or the fact that black lives matter is not enough. Black people need to matter. Um, and that's a daily thing. Black lives matter, you know, we understand that and, and people talk about it as an organization, but really, it, it was something that was, it was, it was, it became, it was a hashtag several years before somebody decided it was going to be an organization because it was a thought and it was a mindset. It was a thought and it was a mindset. And so um, this thought and mindset about Black Lives Matter, um, I have a, I have a weird take on it. Um, if we just look at it from the slave history or the chattel slavery history of the United States, um, a slave owner, who wants to continue to have slaves viewed as property, even when slaves were disciplined, he did not want them killed because that was his property. And so for him, black lives matter. Now we know it's not the same context, it's not the same concept, it's not the same reason why that's the message by those who initially began to talk about the message. But as this, as this phrase has been co-opted and be become a brand and become a trend and various different things like that, people are are using this concept, and I and I use this guy, I say this I use this very loosely, using this concept of Black Lives Matter to again, as I said earlier, to advance their own agenda. That's a concern for me. Because I really believe that black people matter. I believe that black people have always mattered, and I don't think that anybody needs to tell black people that they matter. It's really something that we do outside, that we do inside out. It's really something that, that we have to um, recognize through having a, a strong sense of self and a strong sense of our cultural self and a strong sense of our spiritual self to where we understand that, yeah, you know, God put us here and we are valuable, we matter, irrespective of what another group or groups may say or do. But now the catch, the catch for me is that, that I go, it goes to the concept of when I say black people matter. What that means next is that how are you treating these people that you interact every day? How are you thinking about these people that you interact with every day? How are you addressing some of the systems and policies and practices and structures that are in place that may marginalize some of these people that you say matter? Some of these lives that you say matter. It's not, it's not enough just to say, oh gosh, you know what? We're gonna make Juneteenth a holiday. Have we, have we thought about the fact that that, that communication of truths and facts, and, and we look at Juneteenth through a historical lens, and we look at Juneteenth through how it's been celebrated for years, if we do that, then okay, Juneteenth is a thing. You have companies who now they wanna give Dr. King Day off. We have schools that now they wanna have, um, they wanna do black history programs, and they wanna do a variety of different things to, 
to, to emphasize black lives, quote unquote. But the challenge is just this, as we think in terms of these, these programs, like I was talking to someone at a school, I said, are you gonna connect your black history program to the discipline data and the conversations that you're having there? Or are they two disparate things? Because if you're not gonna say what I understand about black history and what I understand about, uh, about the black experience in America, if I'm not having that, letting that conversation inform the conversation around discipline data, inform the conversation around, um, around how we are um, equipping African-American children to, to, to effectively go into the workplace or to go to college or whatever, if these two conversations are not conflated and they need to be, then, then we're not really doing the work. We're not really benefiting from what we could benefit. So we think in terms of schools. We, we think in terms of public schools. Okay, public schools were largely a result, I mean, like mass public education, were largely a result of the Freedmen's Bureau and the things that took place after slavery, okay? Well, you had blacks who had been freed and now they're saying, we wanna be educated. We wanna be, part of our emancipation is education. Well, from there, then you had Southern whites who were also denied the opportunity for education saying, hey, you know, we want, it, we want access to this education thing also. We gotta have those conversations because then what happened is that as, as, as one group asked, the other group received, and then the other group received more than the group that was asking. And so then we get into the whole conversation about separate and unequal and different things like that. We get into a lot of conversations where um, if we don't really talk about the public school conversation and we don't really understand Brown versus Board of Education in its truest of context, we don't think about Mendes versus Westminster. We don't think about Brown versus Board of Education and the unintended consequences of Brown where you had black teachers who were PhDs who had done amazing, amazing things with black kids no longer being having access to employment in K-12 schools because they were being replaced by white teachers that in, as, as the schools were being integrated and different things like that and, and schools closing. We, we have to think about all the implications of this, Joe, from a public school standpoint. When we think in terms of an independent school standpoint, a large number of American independent schools that are, um, that are, that, 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 that came into existence after like 1950, 1960s, whatever, a lot of those were not just about a privatized education. It was about, we're not gonna integrate and we have the resources to keep our kids away from those black kids. But if we don't talk about that, then at our independent schools, and we begin to look at, at, at what our, what, who's at our independent schools, we don't see opportunities to, see, I'm not saying that independent schools change their business model. I, I'm saying that independent schools change their strategic plan. If you wanna, if, if your goal, if you have all white kids because your independent school is in a place that it's just all white kids there, I'm not, I'm not gonna begrudge that. You, you're doing business. But if you don't take this opportunity, this moment, if you will, to expose your children to other children, the children at your school, your students, your, to other scholars who may exist in Alabama, who may exist in South LA, who may exist in Harlem, who totally look, don't look like the ones that they interact with regularly. If you don't, and I'm not saying through just reading, I'm saying now we have technology. You can do, you can do a variety of different things where you could have kids authentically interacting and developing, again, relationships with those other kids from different parts. If you're not taking the time to do that part of the work, and I know that that's, that's the long game, I get it. I know you gotta have the preliminary conversations first, but if in your strategic plan, of equity, your strategic plan of dealing with anti-black racism, your strategic plan of, of, of developing a more healthy humanity, your strategic plan of, of promoting, as, as, the, as the Constitution says, the general welfare, if your strategic plan does not consist of long-term goals like that, I think you need to kind of rethink some of your practices. I've worked at, I, I, I've, I've taught at in public education, I've worked closely with charter schools and private schools and parochial schools. Um, I'm very familiar with, with several Christian schools. Um, I, I have a lot of conversations with with folks at the higher ed level, in the public and the private, and then the and then the Catholic school, a Catholic university realm. I I think it's so so important, Joe, that we begin to to 
again, I'll say it, think the long game. We begin to say, what does this look like? What does schooling look like? There, there's folks that out there talking about, um, there's some amazing research saying that schooling in its present form is a violent act against black kids. And there's some research out there, research that, that I've looked at and I'm like, this makes a lot of sense to me. You know, and not in the terms of just educating folks, but it's a violent act in terms of the context that they have to go, the context they have to exist in to get this education. And then as they're dealing with these, these different pieces of um, what it feels like to be in school, you have conversations around the, 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 tel the chromosomes and telomere growth and telomere um, shortening and lengthening. And it's real scientific research that connects our experience to our mental experience to our physiological experience. And so I'm saying, Joe, schools have to, they have to think about these things or at least at, at the very least be informed about these things. Okay, and then think, like we said earlier, not just think about them, they gotta think through them. What are the implications? So, so as we see independent schools jumping on board, praise God, I'm excited for that. As we see public schools saying they're gonna do different things and they're gonna look at black teacher recruitment, I love it. But I'm just, I'm just going to continue to push and challenge folks to think about it in the proper context, to think through it and th think through it using a lens of history, using a lens of um, social cultural dynamic, using a lens of contemporary discussions, and then also ongoing um, narratives and counter narratives that, that, that speak to these things. Um, and we're not gonna all agree. That's the, that's the other part. We have to be okay with not all agreeing. Joe, you and I, we agree on a lot of stuff, but there's also things that we see differently and we see them distinctly differently. And that's okay because the fact that we see them differently will continue to allow our dialogue to, to do one or two things, to challenge both of us to get off our position or to provide enough evidence for us to get on the same position. But if we don't, if we don't, I'm not, I'm not saying these conversations mean, you know, give up your belief, give up your, your position. No, I'm saying these conversations mean you personally think through your dogma, think through your, your, your positionality, and, and, and wherever you stand, understand that you may be standing opposed to another human. And so see them in their humanity, see them in their, in their opportunity and their right to have a difference of opinion and push and challenge and maybe argue and do whatever, but don't, don't cross that line of, we are both, we don't cross that line of humanity. I think when a, when a, when a conversation about an issue becomes a conversation about someone's person, where you're demeaning their person, well, maybe we've crossed the line. I mean, and people could argue that from a, a few different sides, but I think if, when we argue issues and we, we deal with issues in school and in education, I mean, because some people would say the best education for a kid is a private school. Best education for a kid is a public school. Best education for a kid is a religious school. Best education for a kid is a home school. There was an organization, I'm not even sure if it's still in existence anymore, but the name of this organization was um, BAO, Black, was it Black Alliance for Educational Opportunities. I think that's what it was, right? And it talked, one of the things, I went to a BAO conference years ago, and one of the things I remember, it said, you know what? All of, we have all these different ways that schooling can be done because one way does not work for everybody. And if we understand the history of schooling in America, I mean, early on, it was just for the elite. Um, and then we went from it being for the elite to it being for the masses to a lot of the, you know, a, a lot of folks understood the, the, the a, lot, a lot of religions, particularly in this country, Christian and Catholic institutions or, or people understood the importance or, or espoused the importance of, of, of education as it relates to one's spiritual growth and health. I mean, but we got to talk about this stuff, man. And, I, and like I said, I have some strong beliefs and some strong positions. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not going to get off of those. But one of those strong, well, let me say this. I'm, I, I don't easily, I'm not easily moved from those. So I get, I understand when people, you know, are, 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 have, a, have a strong belief. But one of the things that I've realized is this, is that if I don't talk about them, 
I'll never be able to see if I'm in the right place or the wrong place. Conversation allows me to, to strengthen and, and, and validate my position or to see the holes in my position. So yeah, school, schooling is going to be fun, fun because the other thing is this, is that even as we, we're talking about um, historical issues, um, this whole thing with distance learning, distance learning is going to be, um, is going to reveal some of the gaps that we have in terms of equity and access in our society. It already is. And some of those gaps are going to be based upon communities, based upon, I mean, I'm, you know, it, it, some, of it, some of it comes down to economics. Some of it comes down to, um, to, to, to politics, I guess. But we have that, that we're, we're going to see how schools address it. I mean, when schools start talking about, we're going to do a hybrid model, or we're going to do a, a going back fully model, or we're going to do, you know, a full distance learning model. All of those have social, cultural, well, all of those are, are happening in a social, cultural context, and they have implications for the decisions that are being made. And if you're not pulling in these groups and thinking through how it might impact different social and cultural and, and, and economic, you know, demographics, you're not really saying that, that people matter. And more intentionally, you're not really saying that black people matter. And if black people don't matter, then it's going to be hard for you to convince me that you believe that black lives matter. All right, so this is the deal, Joe. I think that there's a big issue that, that we need to, that, that, that there's an elephant on the table right now. And the elephant on the table is, how do I move forward with, with, with personal responsibility um, in these conversations around racism, class, culture, equity in our society? I think one of the things that, that we need to first begin to look at is, what is two? You have value clarification, and then the other is agency. Let me start with value, clarif oh, value clarification. I'm not sure that we all are aware of what our values are. I think we have ideas. I think we have things. We have um, bandwagons that we jump on. I think that we um, have things that, that we think are cool. But I mean our core values. What are those things that, 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 we, that our, our life is rooted in, that we would, that we would support, you know, if, if, even if they were not issues? Um, what are our core values? Now, specifically as it relates to this work, um, I, was, I was reading something the other day, you know, and, and, they, and they were talking about how the majority society, the majority group or the dominant group in our society has shown financially over time um, consistently that they are very passionate about the health and well-being of animals through legislation, through all this kind of stuff, right? That same group, I can't necessarily say that the same energy, as my kids say, has been given towards issues as it relates to black people or other marginalized groups in the society. And when I say marginalized groups, I'm talking about marginalized groups that are stamped. Some marginalized groups are not stamped. You can move in and out of those as, as Isabel Wilkerson talks about, you can move in and out of those spaces and it's not necessarily a caste relationship. It can be a conditioned relationship or it can just be a, a preference relationship. But when we start talking about black folks, we're talking about, I can't be black today and not black tomorrow. I can't be not black next Wednesday for this job interview and then black on Thursday when I show up for work. It's all day, every day. And, be, and because of that, there's some things that I, that, that I need to be clear on. I need my values in terms of, of who I am. I have to be very intentional so that I can begin to have these conversations. I was challenged years ago. I said, you know what? I really want my, my work, the primary work that I do through the university, I really want that work to be focused on supporting and, and advancing the, the situation as it relates to black youth. And I, we talked about a series of, 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 of my personal values. And a buddy of mine was like, he said, you know, that, that, that's a hard hill to stand on. And when you decide to stand on that hill, you need to be ready for everything that goes with that. Well, I'm learning. I'm learning. And, and, and as I'm learning, I'm trying my best to, to more and more be committed to, to standing on that hill. But the second thing that I think that, um, that goes with that, um, with that value for clarification is I think about, for me, my values are, you know, 
my my relationship with with my creator through through Jesus Christ. My values are my family. My values are education. My values are um are are um um supporting you know issues as it relates to 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 black kids. And I can go on and on and on. My wife and I, you know, we we as we make decisions, we try to make our decisions consistent with our values. Um, we try to teach our children, make your decisions consistent with your values. I would say to schools, I would say to organizations, I would say to all of us who are engaged in this conversation in this moment in time, are, is what we're doing consistent with our values? Because if they are, we should be a mission-driven people to constantly push. And when we mission drift, if we think about our values, we'll come back. In a biblical, in a biblical sense, it's referred to as repentance. When you go astray, you repent and you come back. The deal is just as we're thinking about this cultural work and this work around, um, around uh, 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 of just racism in our society and how we're going to address it. We have to be mission driven. We have to be clear. We have to have a vision. But we have to have, be, there's an old book called value, Values Clarification. Our values have to be clear. When our values are clear, then we will consistently move in a direction, even unto death. And that sounds very drastic and, and, and like, oh my gosh, when we think of great leaders and people who have been committed to things, their values were so clear that they lived those values even unto death. Um, that's one piece of, of this work. It's a harsh question, but I'd ask myself first and, and anyone that I speak to is that, is this the kind of work that you're willing to die for? Just a question. That's values clarification in its ultimate sense. There's different levels, but in its ultimate sense. The second part that we talked about is this thing about agency. Um, if we're gonna be working, we need to be working ourselves out of a job. And what I mean by that is this, is that when I think about kids and me being a teacher, when I used to tutor years ago, I used to tell parents, they were like, you know what? Um, can you tutor my child for X, Y, Z amount? I'm like, listen, as a tutor, if I, do my, if I do my job right, my goal is to teach your child how to do this on their own and to tutor myself out of a job. Not just to maintain the position so that I give them a little bit and give them a little bit, kind of like welfare. I give you a little bit, but I never put you in a position the way you can stand on your own. The challenge is this, is that we have to be committed to, to building agency in young people because young people are the ones that are gonna continue this conversation going on. We have to be con 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 committed to building agency in communities so that they have the economic wherewithal, so that they have the, 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 um, the, the, the academic and intellectual wherewithal, so that they have all these pieces to be able to stand on their own. I was asked by, by one of my white brothers, you know, a few, a few weeks ago, and, and actually forget what I was asked, James Baldwin spoke to this also, um, and I probably was inspired by his statement. Someone asked him, um, well, what is, what is, I think it's Dick Cavett maybe, asked him, well, what does Black America want? You know, what do they want from white America? And his response was, just treat us fairly and leave us alone. He said, if you treat us fairly and leave us alone, we typically can figure out some stuff on our own. That goes with anybody. Treat them fairly and leave them alone so that they have the same access that you do, but then they're not going to be, they're not going to be thwarted. They're not going to be um, mistreated. They're not going to be discriminated against. You know, just treat them fairly and leave them alone to, 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 to work these things out. Give them equal access. If, if I come in for a job and I get the job, let, 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 look at me through a lens of this dude can do the job. If I don't get the job, Look at me through the lens of this guy is not going to be the one who could do the job. But please, these, 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 these marginal peripheral conversations around this person is not a fit. Sometimes that's coded. Sometimes that can mean organizational culture, but sometimes that's, cold, that, that, that's a code for issues of race, class, and culture. And so we have to be really honest as we're having those conversations. So in terms of agency, though, going back to agency, I think that we need to be equipping young people to fly. We need, as educators, we need to be equipping them with the tools that they need to stand alone in whatever space. And that comes through, and that has a lot to do with their, with helping them understand their cultural self. That has a lot to, to do with them understanding um, 
having a historical perspective on things. One of the things that I, that I, that I think about often is I'll leave a workshop and somebody may ask a question that, that, may, that, that others in the workshop have considered that question to be racist. And they've asked me, well, Darren, you didn't get upset about that. And I always think, why would I get upset if I'm equipped and I'm armed with information? Because it's a question. And the question may have been a question that was asked inappropriately or with a nefarious under, under, undertone. But for me, I'm like, if I'm equipped, if, 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 I, if I have the information, if I have the agency to stand in that space, hashtag thank you, Howard University. But if I have the agency to stand in that space, then when you come to me in a, from, from, a, from an awkward, strange, irreverent, ir, irrespe- disrespectful kind of positionality, it doesn't bother me because I can, I can stand in that space. Now it may irritate me, but it doesn't keep me from standing. It doesn't keep me from being productive. It doesn't, it doesn't keep me from taking advantage of the opportunities that are in front of me. Agency is huge. So values clarification, we need to make sure that folks are clear on their values and then also building agency in everyone. Now, I'm talking about agency in terms of, of those who have been disenfranchised and marginalized and different things like that. But I'm also talking about agency from those who may be part of the dominant culture and, don't, and aren't, aren't familiar with this information. Well, we should be training people not to say, I have the information. We should be challenging people to think and go get the information. San, Sankofa, as a word, it means go back and get it. I would challenge folks from a Sankofa perspective to, there's no danger in, in fetching that which has been lost. If you are um, uh, an administrator that 30 some percent of these administrators in, and maybe even more, um, public school administrators said their, their programs did not equip them to address the needs of black or Latino or, or, or um, or low income students. You can go back and do that work. It's not impossible. When I get a call from a Catholic school principal and he's like, Darren, you know what? I don't, I wanna address these things at my school, but I don't know how to do it. That's okay. And I have to be in a position to, to, to not say, oh, I'm so fatigued because this work is fatiguing. To be the quote unquote answer man for these issues and there's a lot of us, and there's a lot of us. When I say a lot of us, anybody who typically has been stamped is, is, is in, in, their, in their circle becomes the answer man for these issues. But I have to ask myself, value clarification conversation, Darren, what's more important? You being tired or you making sure that these people get accurate information and they begin to think about, think through these issues. I gotta push through my fatigue because the work for my children and their children and the children behind them requires that, that me being tired, it's okay. I can get over it. So as we, as we think in terms of where do we go, it's really about this issue around building agency and, and value clarification. Now our solutions, I, I'd love to talk about solutions and, and a lot of times I spend time with teachers talking about solutions in terms of how do you prepare lesson plans? How do you, create a classroom environment that is engaging? How do you um, in, engage families and how do you make your classroom a third space? And it's a lot of different conversations. We could go there, but we're not gonna go there now, Joe, just cause that's, that's, really, uh, another, that's really another level of the work. But what we can say is just this, is that strategies come out of a plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. I think it's even worse than that. I think if you fail to plan, you're just going to be frustrated and you not only are you going to fail, you're really going to impact negatively those others who you seek to serve. And so that's, that's kind of where I am with those, with those things as it relates to, um, to, 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 to really the individual nature, the really the individual responsibility, you know, it's, it's agency and it's value clarification on every level. On the, on the student level, on the adult level, on the um, marginalized level, on those who are marginalizing level, on the, um, on the community level, social level, family level, whatever the case is, white folks, black folks, everybody, all right? 